Hi, right, we're going to break bread thinking about Revelation, Revelation chapter 1, which is the revelation of Jesus. It's all about the Lord Jesus, Revelation, and that's what we're here to remember, Him. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we come to you to focus again upon the Lord Jesus and upon all that we have seen and known in Him and all that He was and is as He works in this world and in our hearts and all he ever shall be when finally he comes again. We pray, Father, that you will open our eyes to him and also to the book of Revelation, that we might not be phased by how difficult it is to us at first blush as we look at it, but that we might see the simple truths which so many have been inspired by over the centuries of human history and the history of your people. Heavenly Father, strengthen us and go with us and bring us through to your kingdom, which is all our hope and all our desire. And Father, forgive us our sin. We're going to read, Father, of how your Son, as the faithful witness, freed us from our sins through his blood. And we pray, Father, that that might mean everything to us and that we might not look to this world, but that we might look to him and to his ever eager desire to save us and to forgive us. Strengthen us then in our faith and strengthen all your children wherever they might be, going through persecution, through depression, through the darkness of whatever is passing through them and over them at this time. We pray that we might look to the end, that we might look to Jesus, that we might look to him suffering for us and be assured of his power in human history, of his power in our hearts and in the course of our lives. And guide us to the end, Father, for Jesus' sake. Amen. So, Revelation. One of the things you've got to bear in mind when you come to read the Bible is that all the Bible was given initially for the initial readership. The people who initially heard it, most people were illiterate, of course, in Bible times. And it has specific relevance to them. But the art of interpreting the Bible is to see that, yeah, sure, that was for them, but it means this for me. And that's particularly true with the book of Revelation. Now, it's got, therefore, various applications to people throughout history. And the most obvious ones, it seems to me, are the way that the book of Revelation and its seals and vials, etc., it's full of allusion to the Olivet Prophecy when Jesus said, what you see in this temple and um, Judaism and the, the system that you see, this is all going to come to nothing. It's all going to be wiped out. But you be faithful. And they're going to persecute you as they did me, if you're in me. So there's a big theme in this book, this vision, of persecution and of endurance. And it was particularly relevant to those Christians who have been baptised, particularly Jewish Christians, who were being persecuted by the Jewish system. And of course it became relevant, of course, also to those living under the Roman Empire in the cult of the Emperor. Caesar is Lord. Caesar is enthroned in glory, etc., etc., so, Revelation is encouraging ordinary people, like you and me, who have believed in Jesus, to be radically different, to step out from the spirit of the age in which they lived, to realise that Jesus is King, He is Lord of my life, He is in control, and He shall come back. And I finally shall be one of those who overcomes and inherits all things, no matter how dark it all seems, no matter how it seems that the beasts or the powers that be are absolutely inviolate, that they are absolutely in power, and I am nothing compared to them, we shall win in the end. That is the point. Jesus wins. That's the summary, you know, in, in two words of the whole book. And he has already won because he died. And there's allusions to his cross, to his blood, to the, the events that we are here to remember all the way through Revelation, that he on the cross is our inspiration as it was to those who were passing through this world over the years. So, 
Let's start at verse 5. This is from Jesus Christ, the faithful witness. It's the Greek word martyr, the faithful martyr, the firstborn from the dead, and the ruler of the kings of the earth. To him that loves us and freed us from our sins by his blood. Well, the big temptation in the first century, if, if you, let's say you're a Jewish Christian, was to not witness. In John's Gospel, John also wrote Revelation under inspiration. There's a lot of similarities between John's Gospel, his letters, and Revelation. He says that there were Jews who believed in Jesus but would not confess him, lest they be cast out. And so the big temptation was then to secretly believe in your heart, but not confess him, to not be a witness. And Jesus touches on this himself in the Sermon on the Mount, when he says, look, you are a city set on a hill that cannot be hid. You have no option but actually to be the light of the world. And that is why you are a candle that I have lit read about that as the candlesticks, the churches, the ecclesias. You're a candle that I've lit to give light. That's the whole purpose of your mission in this world, to give light and not to hide it. But the big temptation for them, as it is for, for us, is to think that I can just be a secret believer, that I can just put a few likes on, I don't know, posts on social media and just secretly just in my heart, yes. You see, we've got to witness. This is one reason we are called to the Lord. That's We are candles that have been lit. And he is set up straight away in verse 5 as the faithful witness. And the implication is that he was the witness unto death. And he thereby became the firstborn from the dead, who loves us and freed us from our sins by his blood. So... All the way through Revelation, it is alluding to the language that was used by the Romans in the cult of empire, and also to the language used by Judaism. I said that Revelation is full of allusion to the Olivet Prophecy, especially the seals are just an extension of the Lord's Olivet Prophecy. So I think it was therefore written before AD 70. And in the run-up to AD 70, one of the big problems was that there was a big wave of sort of Jewish nationalism. We are going to get together and in our strength we're going to fight Rome. We're going to be David against Goliath. We're going to win. We're going to defeat Rome. And a Messiah is going to appear and he's going to lead us in some great messianic fight and battle against Rome and we are going to win and we shall establish the kingdom of God in our own strength. We are going to overcome and fight off Rome. Freedom, that's, that was the call, freedom from Rome. And martyrdom, they kept talking about the Maccabees who some generations before had resisted Gentile rule and been martyred, etc. We are going to martyr be martyred, we will give our lives. Oh, this, of course, you read Josephus, this is what happened, isn't it, in AD 70, that the Jews were fanatic, they hold themselves up in Jerusalem, Romans outside of walls trying to get in there. These guys were just suicide bombers and absolutely driven by religious mania. And this was affecting the Jewish Christians, all those thousands baptised on the day of Pentecost, what happened to them? You read the letter to the Hebrews, the Hebrew Christians, James, Peter, and I think the letters of John, that tells you what happened. They slipped away, most of them, because they got caught up in this spirit of Judaism, that we can get it in our own strength if we fight hard enough. So all these ideas are picked up, and the big slogan that, we're going to be martyrs. No, no, no. Jesus, not Judas Maccabeus or whoever, he was the supreme martyr, the faithful witness. And remember that witness is this Greek word for martyr. He was the faithful martyr, and so are you to be. We are told that we, in Revelation, that we likewise are to be his witnesses. We are to make the witness of Jesus. 
it is to be our witness, but it is to be his witness. We are his witnesses, his martyrs. To put it another way, we are to love as I have loved you. And how did he love us? The death of the cross. Giving life, giving forgiveness, radical grace, radical mercy. That was what led him to his death martyrdom, if, if you wish. And his death there was to free us, we're told in verse 5, from our sins. Now the big cry was freedom from Rome. Revelation is saying, forget that. Freedom from sin. That is the issue. Freedom from sin. And they were hoping that, oh, we're going to have a messianic leader and we're going to have a great messianic battle against the Romans and we're going to get freedom. They're being told, it's already been fought and won and you've already won. Because Jesus fought the ultimate battle as the ultimate martyr, witness, and he has freed us from sin. It is sin which is the devil, the enemy, the Satan, the dragon, not Rome or whatever. Well, what does all this translate out at today? You and I, no matter if you think you're an extrovert, we are all rather shy to witness. We're all shy to turn a conversation around to Jesus. When people think I'm weird, isn't that casting pearls before swine? Uh, somehow we all clam up and we, we cannot just openly, it seems, talk to folks about Jesus. And when you take that breath, and you do twist that conversation around or turn it around to spiritual things, to the things of the Lord Jesus and his kingdom, you are witnessing in the spirit of Jesus. You may face social death. You may face social ostracism for doing that. And people will look at you like you're weird and unfriend you, as it were. Yeah. In our little way, and it's not so insignificant in the age in which we live, that is the equivalent of being his faithful witness and taking the consequence for that witness. And freedom, freedom from sin. Yeah, all around us, the, the idea is that the ultimate freedom that you can attain is financial freedom. They have an excellent, well-stocked pension plan, even to retire early, and to have this fantastic life where you are free and to pay a lot of attention to your health so that you are free from health issues. And it's all such a myth because <laughs> you're still going to die, right? You're not going to enjoy it for very long. Even if you get it, and most people don't even get that freedom. Let's say you get it. Uh, for how long? Uh, until you die, right? Maximum. <laughs> You're probably not going to get it anyway. The freedom that we have is because Jesus died for us, and his blood, we read in verse 5, has freed us from our sins. So, you know, don't get caught up in the politics of the world, we're building a land fit for heroes. Don't get caught up in the idea of, oh, if only I can attain this position in life, then I've got financial freedom, and wow, I'm free. I can buy a nice car and follow where those adverts lead, that if you buy this car, this four-wheel drive, you've got an open highway in front of you, and freedom. No. The real freedom is from sin. What does that mean? To be free from sin is quite a common idea in the, uh, in the scriptures. Romans 6, talking about baptism, that we were made free from sin. That's what we read here in Revelation 1. He died for us as the faithful witness to free us from sin. Being made free from sin, you became slaves to righteousness. Romans 8, the law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus has set me free from the law, the principle of sin and death. We are made free 
for freedom, Galatians 5. Did Christ set us free? Romans, the glorious liberty of God's dear children. But what is this freedom that was attained by the blood of Jesus? We read here by the death of Jesus, Romans says. Well, the idea is that we were in slavery to sin and death. The fear of death, Hebrews 2, was what governed us. But a slave could be bought out of slavery. It was called manumission. You could pay a lot of money and get that guy out of slavery, so he was no longer a slave. And of course, in the metaphor, that price that was paid for our redemption, for our freedom, was the blood of Jesus. And so we have been freed. We've been bought out of that slavery to sin. And we are made free from sin. That doesn't mean that we will not sin, unfortunately. Romans 7 is quite clear. We, unfortunately, reality on the ground is we are repetitive sinners. We should not be, but we are, I'm afraid. And I don't in any sense wish to minimise sin. But we are made free from sin in the sense that its consequence, which is death, is now dealt with. It means that at this point in our lives, we can say that if the Lord comes now, or I die now, I will be saved. I shall rise from the grave when Jesus comes, and I will live forever. That is the point. And so, although we sin, we are freed from it. We are not, oh, I've failed again, another big F for fail on my report. Oh, and again, oh, and again, oh, I'm hopeless. We are freed from that. Because really he has dealt with sin for us. Yeah, Daniel 9, talking about Messiah, the Prince, he shall come and shall make an end of sin, it says. I like that. Make an end of sin. Sin carries on, unfortunately. But we have been redeemed. We have been brought out of slavery to it. That, oh, I can't get over it. Oh, oh, wretched man that I am. Sure, wretched man that I am. But that wretched man has been freed. Not that we are forced not to sin again, but in that we have been forgiven and are forgiven and are loved. We just read there, to him who loves us and freed us from our sins. We are free from sin because he loves us and his love is particularly manifest in his death. The Son of God loved me and gave himself for me. Man is not alone. Man is not alone. Because God loves me and has given his son to die for me, to free me from sin. And in the context in which Revelation is being given, there you are know, Christians all caught up with, oh, let's get involved with, uh, with freedom from, from Rome, fighting Rome, and we shall find freedom. Yeah. Freedom for what? However many years you've got left in this world to cough and hack your way through. Big deal. We have been given freedom from sin. And if you're a spiritual person, that's everything. If my sin is dealt with, oh, great, oh, I'm ready to die, I'm ready to give my life to whatever the Lord wants me to do, everything goes pear-shaped in life, all right? But I'm free from sin. Okay, right. you get cancer, you get this, you get that, okay, sure. Got to cough and hack our way through it to the end, fair enough. But I'm free from sin, and I will rise from, from the grave. Whoa. If you're just going for human freedom, the sort of freedom that was offered by militant Judaism, which didn't even get there anyway, they were wiped out in AD 70, well, so what? You're still going to die. Freedom, well, for how long? And you're not going to get it anyway. So... <clears throat> The problem is that there is, in human nature, a tendency, I think, to prefer the chase rather than actually finding it. You know. Paul puts it like this, ever learning but never able to come to the knowledge or acknowledging of the truth. There's people who spend all their lives, they say, searching. Oh, I'm a man in search of God. And I'm searching. Oh, yeah, man. Yeah. And what if you found it? 
And you see, th this is the problem. It's like people spend their lives searching for the perfect relationship. Divorce this one, live with that one, divorce that one, all this kind of stuff. And they still don't get there in the end anyway. Now, this is the one. Oh yes, now, you know, my fifth marriage. Now, now I've found her. Now I've found him. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, like you told me five times before, <laughs> over the years. I don't find it. But it is a propensity of our nature to prefer seeking. And I, again, this is, I think, what John's Gospel particularly is on about when it, it says Jesus is the truth. Oh, you're searching for truth, you've got it. And this is the truth, that he died for you, freed you from your sins, and you're going to live forever. That's the ultimate truth of the cosmos. That is the truth. Yeah, searching for correct interpretation of this, and the correct philosophy about this thing. That, finally, is the ultimate truth. The rest is peripheral, the rest is cosmetic. That is the ultimate truth for you personally, for me personally. Now, something you find a lot in Revelation is praise of the Lord Jesus. A lot of praise, and you've got it here in Revelation 1, in verses 5 and 6. Why is that there? I think it's because, apart from their difficulties with the surrounding militant Judaism, there were others who were not Jews who were living in the Roman Empire, and they were supposed to be in the cult of empire. The Roman Empire was pretty well presented as the kingdom of God, and the king was, of course, Caesar. Here you look at the inscriptions on the arches, you look at the inscriptions on coins, Caesar is Lord, Lord of all lords, King of all kings. You disagree with that, you're in trouble. This is where the New Testament, the book of Revelation in particular, was pretty well underground literature. This was radical, this was going right against the cult of empire. There is another king, one called Jesus. This is what they dragged up against Paul, wasn't it? when he was preaching, and Revelation is full of this, playing on this. So, Jesus is the Lamb sitting on the throne, not Caesar in Rome, but Jesus in heaven, who is going to come back to little obscure Jerusalem, in the context of the Roman Empire, and have his kingdom there. And Christians are presented as revolutionaries, that we're waiting in the wings for our leader to come, and we're going to rise up for him. That's a spirit in which we live our lives. Now, we're told there in, in verse uh, 6 that he has made us kings and priests. King priests. And we shall reign on the earth. Now, one of the big things in the cult of empire was that you as a Roman citizen have the possibility to be rulers of the known earth the known world, because you could be sent off to somewhere in Gaul or whatever, or to Palestine for that matter, or somewhere in what is now called Turkey, and you, as a Roman citizen, could become a ruler of this particular area. You could be elevated to be the consul of this particular town or district or whatever. Caesar made his citizens kings. That was the idea under, of course, Caesar, who is the king of kings. All that language is being alluded to and kind of radically subverted. Jesus has made us kings. And we shall reign on this earth forever. Not in the empire of Rome, which is to pass away, but in the kingdom of God, which is to come on this earth and last forever. So this is, this is a, a very radical idea, very, very radical. And as I say, it is no less radical for us because we don't live in the Roman Empire, but we live in the world that we live in where the idea is that if you go the way of education, if you go the way of smart investment, if you go this way or that way, you will get to the dream. And you will have your part in a wonderful kingdom. Well, you look around this world and you look at the people who've, quote, made it, committing suicide, drug addicts, addicted to, you know, drugs and pills and the rest of it. 
There's not much of a kingdom, frankly, and it's not going to last so very long because you don't get much of a crack at it. Um, and with much wealth comes much grief, uh, as we know. We are living for another kingdom. Absolutely radical. And it, it's like revolutionaries, as I say. You read the uh, biographies of the early lives of men who later came to power from nothing. Adolf Hitler, Joe Stalin, Lenin, all these guys. Lenin particularly, and Hitler particularly. Yeah, they went through this part in their lives when they were sitting around in coffee shops and bars working on the revolution with their mates and all their thinking was about this. They did a day job and they had some level of family life, but their obsession was the revolution, how they were going to rise up against the oppressors and they were going to be rulers. Of course, most, most of those guys never make it, but if you've got the biographies of the guys who did make it, yeah, that's you and me <laughs> meeting up in ones and twos, to break bread, to encourage each other in the ultimate revolution that's going to come, that we know that I can't bring about it myself, but he's coming, the leader is coming, and he's there in heaven. And we are his cell groups here on earth, meeting up in the bar, in the coffee shop or whatever, with each other, not to talk about the, the weather or whatever, but to strengthen each other's hands in the things of the kingdom, the kingdom of God. We are out of this whole scene where we are. This world is not our resting place. This whole thing is passing away. We're not trying to work to change this whole thing. This thing needs to be radically overthrown. And the message that is in Christianity, in the message of the return of Jesus to the earth to establish his kingdom on earth, that's what that is, a radical overthrowing. Of all this rubbish that is on the face of the earth, it is not in man that walks the directed steps. That is quite clear. Every human leader has got feet of clay, that's how it is. But we have got absolutely the one who will not disappoint. And he has set us the path. He died, freed us from sin, and he is coming back. And even if we die before the, as it were, the revolution, no worries. You don't die thinking, oh, well, I didn't live to see it. I hope my kids live to see it. No, you will rise again and you will have your eternal part in it. It's wonderful, absolutely wonderful. But you see, of course, that this is a, a radical separation between the believer and the world. Absolutely radical, totally radically different. They have a totally different mindset, a totally different set of values. And we go in some place completely different to where they are going. Well, verse 8, I am the Alpha and the Omega, says the Lord God. Well, Trinitarians like to be quick to say yes, and Jesus says I'm the first and the last. Clearly alluding to Alpha and Omega, we might say the A to the Z. Alpha, the first letter of the Greek alphabet, Omega is the last. But you notice it's slightly different. God says, I'm the Alpha and Omega. Jesus says, I am the first and the last. Jesus is functioning as God. He is not God. But he has the names and titles of God as the angels did in the Old Testament. He is not God. I'm not Trinitarian. Absolutely not. But Jesus functions as God in this world. That he is the ruler of this planet. He's allowed things to go on for a brief moment. I mean, what is 6,000 years? I mean, it's nothing, nothing in the spectre of eternity. And he was made king of kings 2,000 years ago, let's say, when he ascended to heaven. And he's allowed for this very brief time human beings to have their way, little ants scurrying around on the face of the planet thinking that they're so cool and hoping to build this and hoping to build that and to overturn this and build something better. Okay. We've, in this very, very brief window of opportunity, we have been called to understand how frail all that is and how vain it is and to accept him as our king and the things of his kingdom. So then, 
He verse 8, who was, is, and is to come. Well, they're clearly alluding to the Yahweh name. But in this context, I want to say that that was the very terminology that the Caesars used about themselves, that Augustus was, is, and shall ever be, that sort of thing. All being subverted, absolutely subverted to Jesus and to the things of God's name. He is the one who was, is, and is to come, not Caesar who's going to die and be, be gone. And so, as I say, our whole value system becomes changed. I, John, verse 9, your brother and partaker with you in tribulation, and the kingdom and patience of Jesus, was in the isle that is called Patmos because of the word of God and the testimony of Jesus. So many times the book of Revelation speaks simply of Jesus. That's quite unusual because in the rest of the New Testament, the resurrected, glorified Jesus is nearly always spoken of as the Lord, or the Lord Jesus. But Revelation just uses this plain word, Jesus. And yet, Revelation is full of very exalted language about Jesus, that he's functioning as God over this whole earth. There is a juxtaposition. What that means is two apparently opposing ideas are put adjacent to each other. And the idea is that his, the height of his exaltation is because he was so human. And you got it in Hebrews 1, where the human side is, the verse is quoted about Jesus, where it says, God, even your God, anointed you with the oil of gladness above your fellows. So God is your God. You know, and we are his fellows. But then, adjacent to that, in the same few verses, he yeah, pretty well talks about Jesus as if he's God. Well, Jesus isn't you know, God himself and all that. But this very high language of exaltation, right bang next to God, even your God. And it's the same here, Jesus. Not Lord Jesus, nothing else. Jesus. Plain and simple. It's quite unusual. All the rest of the New Testament, the resurrected Jesus is very rarely called Jesus. Always Lord Jesus. There's always some title there. Or just call him the Lord. And it's the same idea that because he had our nature, that is why he, as Paul puts it in Hebrews, has ascended up through all the heavens to the right hand of the throne of God. It's the same idea here in Revelation. He, one of us, Jesus, is there as King of Kings and the whole Lord and Master of the Cosmos on God's behalf. Bear in mind that the name Jesus was the most common name given to little boys at their birth in Palestine around the time Jesus was born. Archaeological excavations have shown that, name lists, etc., in documents, so on. Jesus was the most common name for Jewish men at his time. It's like talking about the president as Dave, not Mr. Mr. David Smith or whatever the name of the guy is, not uh, David Smith, but Dave, not the president, Dave. It's, it's intentional that somebody with the most common name overcame sin and is ascended. Beautiful. And of course, why is that in Revelation? Because it was written for ordinary people like you and me, Dave's and Joe's and all the rest of us. Ordinary people to say, look, here is the faithful witness. Sure, your sin messed up, but he didn't and he made it. And he is coming again for you, despite your weakness. Okay, but he died to free you from your sin. And it was one of us. It was one of our boys who is there, who is now the Lord of the cosmos. It's a beautiful idea. So then, go on. It's lovely stuff, all this. 
Okay, verse 12. He hears a voice, and I turned to see the voice that spoke to me, and having turned, I saw seven golden candlesticks. Well, often the scriptures in the New Testament particularly employ this idea of dashed expectation to make a point. He hears a voice, and he, he turns, and what do we expect? We expect him to turn and say, and he saw Jesus. He hears a voice and he turns and he sees seven candlesticks, which we're later told are the churches. The idea of that is, Jesus is identified with us, with the churches. Just as he said to Paul, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? Jesus is identified with the churches. And yet you're going to read in chapters 2 and 3 how dysfunctional the churches, the lampstands were. And of course the image is of, he hears a voice coming from the candlesticks, the idea is there's a man there behind the candlesticks. Don't forget, most of the readership here were familiar with the temple and were, were Jewish Christians. A man amongst the candlesticks, this is a priest who's on duty, trimming the, uh, the candles and, uh, and so forth. Now, we are the candle that has been lit. When you come to the Revel Revelation 2 and 3, to the letters of the churches, you see, oh dear, the candlestick is in a bad way. It is very dysfunctional. The light is not clear. And that, of course, is how it is. Let us not think that Christianity, after the resurrection of Jesus, is actually going to perform better than the Old Testament people of God. You look at Hebrews, you look at 1 Corinthians 10, Romans 11, it's all pretty clear, if you ask me, that actually we will not be better than them. This is again the picture here in Revelation 1-3, to talking about the candlesticks as the churches, that yeah, the church as an institution is not going to be a great picture. But, all the same, Jesus is identified with that. So, verse 13. In the midst of the candlesticks, one like a son of man, dressed in a robe, reaching down to his feet, and with a golden sash around the chest. Now, remember this is given largely to Jewish Christians. In the first context, as I began by saying, you've got to understand to whom this was given initially. Well, the same word for robe, he's dressed in a robe, is used in the Septuagint for the high priestly robe. So you see here a high priest, and it is a robe down to the feet. Well, Josephus says that that was how the high priest was dressed in the first century. The Old Testament doesn't exactly say how uh, he was to be, uh, how the, the length of the robe. Then he's got this golden girdle, which clearly alludes to the sash or to the belt of the high priest. But that was made of blue, and this is made of gold. So the idea is, this is a high priest, but of a much superior nature to the Jewish high priests under the law of Moses. Now, the Lord Jesus is not specifically stated here to be the high priest, just as we're not told Jesus is sitting on the throne, we're told the Lamb sits on the throne. And the whole idea is, I think, that it's visual symbolism. The book of Revelation is very visual. And if you ask yourself, why is the book hard to understand? I think it's because it is so visual. And as soon as you, you put visual stuff down on paper, as it were, in words, sort of it gets difficult. It's rather like trying to describe the Mona Lisa in, uh, in words. You sort of can't. You say, yes, well, the question about the portrait of the Mona Lisa is, she's got this smile just at the playing of the corner of her lips, and what was that for? Is she amused by you, by the person she's looking at? Has the person she's looking at just made a joke and she's smiling? Is she not looking at anybody? but just remembering in her own mind something amusing from years ago. Is she flirting with you? 
Right, all those questions that arise, but it's hard to describe the Mona Lisa in words. You've got to see it before you can engage with you know, the questions that arise from the painting. Now, Revelation was given, I suggest, to people who were largely illiterate. And the generations subsequent were largely illiterate. So they were not straining over the symbolism. It was all a visual image. This is the genre of apocalyptic. And some of those images sort of coincide with each other and overlap each other. It is a, a kaleidoscope at times of, of images. And I think, as I say, that's one reason Revelation is hard to understand, especially for us, we who are used to reading and working out symbolism, it's because it's so visual. And I think at times we've got to be like the illiterate audience and just imagine it visually. Some very good uh, visuals that have been done more recently about the book of Revelation. All sorts of people, David Miles, in Birmingham in the UK is very good, my, sorry to mention it, but my mother-in-law, Robin Jones in Sydney, Australia, she's, she's very good as well. Some of that visualisation is really very, very helpful. That's just en passant. So, this person who is amongst the candlesticks is a priest, and actually is the high priest. And then we are going to read about how he's dressed, and you read about his feet, like burnished brass. And what does that mean? It means he hasn't got any shoes on. The high priest always served without shoes, particularly on the Day of Atonement. And we are told here that John saw this, verse 10, on the Lord's Day, the Day of the Lord, which is a common phrase for the Jewish feasts. This is a high priest, not just a priest, a high priest. As you read the uh, description of, of him with the, the girdle, well, like the, the sash of the high priest, etc. You are, you've got a picture here of, of the high priest appearing and speaking. That's what the high priest did on the Day of Atonement. Verse 10, we're told that this was on the Lord's Day on a Jewish feast. So then, this figure of Jesus, it's clearly Jesus, appears several times throughout the book, and it's the same Jesus. The Jesus who is the high priest, who speaks on the Day of Atonement. When you come to later on in Revelation, you're going to read about incense and censers. Well, that's the Day of Atonement. Again, just forgetting, we're not sweating the, the, the interpretation of the symbolism, but just seeing the visual impression. That's the priest on the high priest on the Day of Atonement. In Leviticus 16, it is clear that on the Day of Atonement, he took a censer full of burning coals into the most Holy place. I think the idea was that the, the billowing smoke from the censer was to sort of shield him from kind of God's glory. And then he came out, he came to Israel and pronounced their forgiveness. So I think that all the way through Revelation, we are seeing Jesus as a priest, a high priest pronouncing forgiveness on the Day of Atonement. And yet he's also very clearly judging people for their sins. And that's why the, the Day of Atonement was known in Judaism as the Day of Judgment. But these are two sides of the same coin. In order to achieve God's kingdom on earth with us there, there has to be this pronouncing of forgiveness and also judgment, judging of this world. There has to be. Two sides of the same coin. And all the way through, Jesus is there in judgment, as it were, and yet also the priest on the day, high priest on the day of atonement, pronouncing the word of pardon, the word of absolute assurance of forgiveness. 
Now, this vision that we have of Jesus here in Revelation 1, bits and pieces of it are repeated in all the letters to the churches in chapters 2 and 3. For example, in Revelation 2, 18, he, he's described as having eyes like a flame of fire. Well, that's what we read here in chapter 1. His feet with burnished bronze, letter to the fire tire, letter to fire tire. He's got a sharp sword in his hand. It's all out of chapter one. So I think the idea is that this glorified Jesus, before whom John fell as if he were dead, awed by him, it is him who is walking around in the churches, despite all their awful dysfunction. And so, the idea is that he is here with us, in all his glory. But that he does not turn away from those churches, weak as they were, terribly weak. Prostitution going on, and you know, Jezebel, and Thyatira, and all this kind of thing. Lost their first love in Ephesus. So, despite all that, he is still present amongst those who are lit by him to be his candles. So then, all the way through, all the judgments and all that that we, we're going to read about here in Revelation, the Lord Jesus is present amongst us, yes, as the Lord of judgment, but also as the high priest on the Day of Atonement, pronouncing forgiveness for those who want it. And it's really those two sides of the same coin that you see here in all that's represented in the bread and wine. This is why the cup of wine is a double symbol. God gave Babylon a cup of wine to drink. To be given a cup of wine to drink from the Lord is a symbol of your condemnation. But it is also, as Paul says, the cup of blessing which we bless. So, again you come to this binary position that there is. Two exits from the Day of Judgment, to eternal life or to eternal death. Jesus is either the High Priest pronouncing condemnation or forgiveness. But we are his people. He died to set us free from sin. And we have come out of this world, surely. Surely you're not you're dreaming that you're going to make it in this world. Surely you're not dreaming of freedom and all the rest of it for a couple of decades at best in your life, at the end of your life. Surely you've seen through all that. And we are his. He died to free us from our sin. He is the faithful witness. He is the one who lives, who was dead, and is alive forevermore. We are him, in him and following that path to his kingdom. When all this stuff will be no more. We know it. And we've got to strengthen each other's hands in that amazing message of the true empire, the real kingdom of God with his son ruling over us. Heavenly Father, we thank you from the bottom of our hearts for this bread which is the symbol of the body of your Son given for us. Father, we thank you that you have called us to know him, and we long for the day when we shall eat and drink again at his table in his kingdom, not in obscurity and smallness as we do now. But we pray that you will keep us on the track to meet him there and to have an eternal part in being the kings of your true kingdom, which shall last forever. For his sake. Amen. Heavenly Father, we take this cup remembering that your Son loves us and freed us from our sins in his blood. We pray, Father, that we might believe that with all our hearts and that we might know that freedom from sin 
and ultimately the freedom from all sin's consequence, even death itself. Please go with us, Father, for Jesus' sake.